in the previous units, we always applied the winner takes all strategy, which is for every pixel in the reference image, we compute the similarity across all disparity hypotheses and then compute, uh, return the patch with the highest similarity or with the lowest matching cost. While using deep learning to compute the similarity scores improves the situation a little bit regarding reducing ambiguities, it doesn't remove all the ambiguities. And so it's beneficial, as we've briefly seen already, to incorporate global optimization rather than just locally taking the winner. And this is what we are gonna focus on in this unit on spatial regularization. Let's recap quickly, what are the challenges? When will local matching fail? Well, what is the underlying assumption? Well, corresponding regions in both images should look somehow similar and non-corresponding regions should look different. So when will this fail? Here we have an example with an image from the Kitty dataset. I'm toggling back and forth so you can get a feeling for what uh, the disparities are and how the local image regions change. If we look closely at the similarity constraint, the local similarity constraint, we can identify some failure cases. For example, there's some patches where there's simply very little or no texture at all, just because the object that we're looking at is not textured or because there's maybe sensor saturation, etc. So matching such a patch becomes very hard because there's many possibilities in the every image where this white patch would also match. Further, if we look at this patch here, we have the tree in front of the building. And if we look from the left image and from the right image, then the patch will look very different because the, the background actually changes. So the background changes relative to the foreground. This is something we've discussed before in the context of disparity discontinuities and the violation of the frontal parallel assumption. So some of this can be, some of these artifacts can be reduced by learning, but not all of them. Another challenge are repetitions. If we have structures in the image, here we have three different uh, patches extracted um, that look very similar to each other, then matching becomes suddenly very ambiguous. All of these patches are so similar to each other that it's really almost impossible to distinguish the, what is the correct one from the wrong one. And then finally here, we have violations of the Lambertian surface model where we have strong specular reflections from the building of the, on the opposite side in the window of this car. And you can see that if I'm toggling now between this is the patch of the left image and this is the corresponding patch in the right image that's corresponding based on the actual surface location. You can see that the content of these patches completely changes, it gives us actually the wrong solution um, at that location. Now, in order to overcome these local ambiguities that cannot be entirely overcome by a Siamese network because it learns only local features is um, to use spatial regularization. And the idea here is very simple. Well, um, what we can ask is if we look at depth images of the real world here in this case here from the Brown range image database where real scenes have been scanned using a LIDAR scanner. If we look at these depth images then we can uh, find very fundamental basic principles about the statistics of these images. So if we look at these images, what's already evident from the images is also evident from this plot, which shows us the uh, derivative of the range or of the log range and the probability for each of, of these values here. What we see from the images is that there's a lot of smooth surfaces. So in most cases, for most adjacent pixels, the depth actually varies very slowly, except at object discontinuities, where the depth varies very quickly from a small value to a large value here, for instance. But depth discontinuities are very sparse. In other words, the number of pixels 
where we have a depth discontinuity is very small with respect to the total number of pixels in the image. For most pixels, the neighbors are looking the same, except for these discontinuities. And that's also reflected in this plot here where we can see that there is a peak at zero. Um, and that means that most of, for most of the pixels, there's actually almost, I mean, the, the, the change is, is very smooth. The change is very slow in terms of depth. But then there is a heavy tail here, which means there is some, some pixels much less, it's a log scale here, but there's some pixels for which we do have a significant a gradient in the depth map. And so now we want to incorporate that constraint into the disparity estimation process. And the way we do that is by specifying a loopy Markov random field, or short MRF, that will be discussed in more depth in lecture five. And we specify that Markov random field on a grid where the nodes in that grid here illustrated on the right, these circles are the pixels. And these little squares are constraints on that pixels. And then we solve the whole disparity map D, which is these pixels at once, where the map solution is the solution with the minimum energy. So we can think of this here for the in the context of this lecture as an energy minimization problem because the probability of the disparity map is proportional to a, such as called a Gibbs distribution and we'll cover this in much more depth in the next lecture um, of an energy or a minus energy term but here inside these brackets we have an energy term in other words if we um, maxim if we're minimizing this energy, we are maximizing the probability because we have probability proportional to expon exponential minus the energy. Now, this, um, this term here, what does it mean? Well, this energy term is composed of two types of terms. There are so-called unary terms, which are the matching costs. This is what we have computed in the previous units. This is what we have basically um, from which we have derived the winner takes all solution. For every pixel, so i is a pixel here, and for every disparity hypothesis, so di is the disparity hypothesis, maybe ranging from zero to 128, we obtain a matching cost. And ideally that cost is very low for the correct correspondence and it's high for the wrong correspondence. That's basically the the negative of the similarity or the inverse of the similarity. Now, this is what we had already. And if we would ignore that term and we would try to maximize this probability or minimize that energy because there would be no connections, no pairwise con uh, uh, potentials, no pairwise terms. So this would go away. We would just have these little squares um, attached to each variable individually then we would obtain the winner takes all solution because there's no constraints between pixels. But what we're doing now is we are introducing constraints. And in this case, on a four connected grid, remember again, each of these variables that we want to estimate, these variables from the MRF, these are these Ds, um, we have one per pixel. And then we have connections between adjacent pixels here on this four connected grid. So for each pixel, we have the top, the left, the right, and the bottom neighbor. And for each of those, we have such a smoothness term here added that now depends not on a single variable, but on, let's say this variable and the adjacent variable. And then we have one for this and this, and the sum of all of these for all pixels is this term here. So in summary, we have this neighborhood relationship, which is denoted here by this tilde, where i and j are two neighboring pixels on this four connected grid. Then we have unary potentials, which are the matching costs. And then we have these additional pairwise potentials now, which um, model our prior belief about the smoothness of adjacent pixels. And so a very simple model uh, for the smoothness term would be one that says, well, if I have, if I look at two neighboring sites, let's say at this pixel and this pixel, then I wanna have a small energy value if, um, um, the um, uh, elements are the same. Uh, 
um, which is indicated by this expression here. So this is the Everson bracket. So if d and uh, d prime, so the neighboring disparity are not the same, then this will evaluate to one. And if they are the same, this will evaluate to zero. This is what the Iverson bracket denotes. It's basically an indicator um, operator that just evaluates if this expression is true or false. If it's true, if they are dissimilar, then we obtain a one. And if they are the same, then we obtain a zero. Now, this is a very simple and a very stupid model. A better model is to take the relative displacement into account. So we can take, for instance, what's typically taken is a truncated L1 smoothness term where we have the difference between the disparity at the current site and the neighboring disparity d prime and we have an absolute difference here and then we have a, a truncation tau a truncation parameter such that even if this uh, distance is very large we don't induce too much penalty so it's a robust potential and we'll talk about robust potentials also more in the next lectures yeah, so this is a much more reasonable assumption that takes also the discrepancy of adjacent disparities into account up to a certain truncation threshold tau. And then we can solve this MRF approximately using belief propagation. Now we have specified all the potentials. We have computed these matching costs. These are just um, the matching costs as we did them for block matching. And then we have introduced these additional energy terms here. So we have a big, big term now, many, many sums. And now we can solve for the optimal D values. If we would remove this part, then we would just obtain the winner takes all solution because there is no constraints between or no relationships modeled between adjacent sites. But if we introduce these smoothness constraints telling the model, well, if two sites are nearby, then we expect that disparity in most cases is actually quite similar. So we want it to be smooth, the output. And if we minimize that energy, um, then we obtain a different disparity map that's hopefully better than the one we would obtain by just looking at the local information. And so for solving this MRF approximately, this is a difficult problem. We can only solve it approximately. There's a variety of techniques that can be used, such as graph cuts or belief propagation. And in lecture five to seven, we'll in particular talk about the belief propagation algorithm. And so here's a result of this algorithm. Um, applied on the same image that we have seen before, the Cohen's data set from the Middlebury data set. And you can see that now, um, despite we're using a very simple, not even learned similarity metric, we obtain much better results, at least for this very simple scene here with a lot of texture and Lambertian surfaces. And uh, this idea of using Markov random fields to model relationships can be extended from these local pairwise relationships to more global relationships. So in this work here, it's actually a work from our group that what we did is that we tried to model disparities and objects in the scene jointly to give um, constraints that span larger distances, not just adjacent pixels, which is too weak in most cases. And then we obtain the objects, a solution for the object simultaneously to the solution of uh, in terms of the depth for the disparity map on the bottom here. And here's an example of what this looks like. So on the left, you can see the result from this learned um, potentials from the Siamese network, Spontar et al, using already global optimization, but using only pairwise potentials, so very local interactions. And here on the right is an example from this other model, which uses more global constraints by modeling objects.